Tim here with another video and today I've got a slight issue. I'm traveling to America indefinitely and leaving the UK. I need a way for all my belongings to get to America safely. And this 27 inch 2017 iMac is one of those belongings and it's also one of the biggest problems that I'm facing. I don't want to ship this via the sea, it will take too long. I don't want to ship it via plane, it's too expensive. So I'm only left with one option, which is take it as checked baggage. Will this thing even fit in a suitcase? That's the first thing we have to figure out. I've bought this suitcase specifically for the iMac. I think this should work. Let's try and put the iMac in it first and see if it'll actually fit. The iMac fits, the measurements worked. This is great news. But as you can see, if I leave it in this state, it's 100% gonna get broken, which is why we need to move on to the next step of this video and design a case similar to an iPhone case that's gonna protect it during its very long travels of approximately nine hours. So the first thing I'm gonna to wanna to do before I start designing this case is I'm going to take the iMac and measure it. It's quite a hard surface to design and measure, but I'm gonna give it my best shot and use a couple of different tools to do it. And then once I have a really good precise outline, I can start designing the case. So the front of the iMac with the screen is flat, so that's the easy part, but the back of the iMac is curved and sloped. So it's not gonna be very easy to model. It's not a simple shape. The only way I could think of measuring this accurately was using a height map. What is a height map? A height map is a cluster of points. It's called a map because each point has an X and Y coordinate. Unlike 2D maps, what makes these points special is they also have a Z measurement, which represents the height. If we can collect a bunch of these points relative to each other, we can then connect them in 3D space and make the contour of our iMac. This method works well because I can lay the iMac down flat on the table to get the measurements I need. Because it's just me, I'm gonna do this in a very manual way. We're gonna to need to build a jig. To make the jig, I'm going to basically 3D print some parts to attach the aluminum extrusions together, as well as my caliper. Now the caliper has a really cool feature where it's got this long stem that reaches down. That's what I'm gonna be using for probing. So the first things first, I'm gonna to have to design these parts and 3D print them. All right, so I've 3D printed the parts. Now it's time to test fit my 3D printed parts. So the caliper's in. I just have no idea if I'll ever be able to get it out. So the good news is that this works a lot better than I thought it would. The aluminum frame is free to slide along the iMac, which we can then use to modify the X measurement. And the caliper also slides along the extrusion to be able to capture a Y measurement. Lastly, we can slide the caliper down to measure our Z, which is also our height. So I've got my good old journal here to measure the values. Let's see how it goes. That is my zero. I thought taking the measurements on my jig was gonna be difficult, but it turned out to be surprisingly easy. Painstaking, but easy. The difficult part was actually the CAD, which is a bit embarrassing because that's my job. I'm literally specialized in designing parts in CAD. 
And that's the part I struggled with. The reason why I initially struggled with CAD modeling is because I was trying to attempt and do this the quick and easy way by using the loft tool. The way the loft tool works in CAD softwares is it joins two surfaces. But the key here is the two surfaces need to be flat. On our iMac, we have one flat surface, but we're missing the other. The other issue is the loft tool is an approximation of the surface. It's not very precise. And as such, the test pieces that I printed using this method didn't really fit the curvature of the iMac, especially at the corners. And so I switched my approach to what I should have done from the start and used surface modeling. So you can kind of see this as 3D sketching where you've got a bunch of different points in 3D space and then you have to connect them somehow. The best way to connect these points is with splines, which approximates the curvature of the iMac. The last step of surface modeling is I have to manually fill in each surface by choosing the bounding edges. Surface meshing is a lot like making an STL file from scratch. I did still run into some issues getting nice corners with this method. The way I resolved this problem is I refined the mesh at the corners by using more data until I was satisfied with the result. I confirmed this with a 3D printed test piece and I was finally happy to move on to designing the iMac case. For the design of the iMac case, I am taking inspiration from my iPhone case, which is designed by Mouse. There's a couple nice features on this case. First off, like most iPhone cases, it's one singular rigid piece. I really like the idea of making a singular rigid iMac case because I thought it'd be stronger and ultimately it would look more aesthetic. The focus for the case is to protect the edges of the iMac and then leave the screen completely open so you can still use the iMac while having the case on the iMac. Now there's a lot of cutouts that we have to add in order to make the iMac usable. So I added my cutouts to clear things like the power cable, the on and off switch, as well as the Apple logo. And I thought I was done until I realized there's also these holes on the bottom of the iMac which look like vent holes, but they're actually for the speakers. So I put these in. So just in case you wanna blast music with this case attached, you still can. So it looks good so far, and you may think we're done, but there's actually a lot of extra things we need to add to this case. The first thing we're gonna do is mimic the green patches on the mouse case. Now, those are not just there randomly, those are actually silicon, and they provide more shock absorbing qualities for the iPhone case. I wanna mimic that and bring it to the iMac case. So I've made a cutout all along the edges of the iMac, and I'm planning on putting rubber in there to hopefully bring the same shock absorbing qualities to the iMac case. So while that's the design of the case covered, we have one big consideration to think about, which is how do we manufacture this? So for me in my setup, 3D printing is going to be the obvious choice. And I've chosen PLA because it's both tough and strong and it's very easy to print, but we still have a slight issue. My iMac is still much bigger than my 3D printer. So how are we gonna fit the iMac case into the 3D printer? Well, we can do two things. We can get a bigger 3D printer to fit the iMac case, or we can cut the iMac case into sections to fit the 3D printer. As a newly unemployed member of society, I've decided to go for the budget option and cut the iMac into pieces. This comes with extra challenges. The first problem is how do we split these parts up to achieve favorable print orientation? If we want to print these edges with strength and aesthetic in mind, we need to print these edges perpendicular to the print bed. Because the corner edges meet together perpendicularly, if we print one edge perpendicular to the build plate, the other edge is going to be parallel to the build plate, which will require support material and decrease part strength. But there is a compromise we can reach here. By cutting the corner pieces diagonally, we can print all the corners at 45 degrees. This allows the part to be printed without support material and also keeps the strength of the part. So with that out of the way, let's get 3D printing.
The parts have finished printing and you may notice that all the parts have holes in them. I took the time to account for how we're gonna attach this behemoth together. The answer is dowels. Now for some reason, steel dowels are severely underrated. They're cheap, strong, and offer really precise alignment. Yet if I had a penny for each time an engineer forgot to use a dowel, I'd be rich and I'd have a bigger 3D printer. I use four millimeter dowels, but the hole in the CAD is 4.26 to give me a push fit. This is required because the holes print smaller than specified in your 3D model. So my 4.26 millimeter hole in CAD is actually around four millimeters in real life. I have a video on this subject coming up, so if you're interested in the dark art of 3D printing holes, then definitely subscribe. But before we get too sucked into this topic, let's talk a little bit more about adhesion. I'm gonna be using glue to mount my parts, but I do wanna give an honorable mention to Gloop, which fuses plastic parts together. So without further ado, let's get on to the assembly process. First impressions, look at that. <laughs> that is a big case. We're gonna put in the gasket. We got that nice carbon fiber finish on the other side from the plate. So just for scale, this is my iPhone case. Just a little bit bigger. So the way you put this on is you gotta put it through the legs. The legs on these iMacs don't come off. Uh, great design. And now here is the moment of truth. Do we get a click? So that side's in. Oh my goodness. Oh shit. You see how the iMac is clearly way bigger than the case? It's around this point that my brain realized that the case is not going to fit. Unfortunately, my heart took a bit longer to get the message, but after 30 minutes of grunting, I accepted that the slipper did not fit and I proceeded to unglue the pieces that I had just glued together. I wanted to see if any part of the case I'd made would actually fit the iMac. Oh, it's beautiful. Ta-da! Why do we need the middle bit? The main thing I learned is not enough tolerance. But a lot of this tolerance stuff, you only unfortunately learn by just building it and testing it and wasting one and a half kilograms of filament. So if I had to rate my day, maybe 4 out of 10. If you think about it, my day is a 4 out of 10 today. The chances of it being a 4 out of 10 tomorrow? Unlikely. So yes, the case was too small. I didn't quite leave enough tolerance. PLA just isn't as flexible at this size. And it's part of the reason why snapping the lip of the case around the iMac edge is nearly impossible. And so the solution was staring at me in the face. I needed to redesign the case and reprint it. And the new design needed to be a two-piece case that assembled together. I first scaled the case up, and then I removed the massive middle section, mainly to save on print time, which was now 12 hours instead of 32. But there's also another huge benefit of saving almost one kilogram of filament. 
The main goal was always to protect the edges of the iMac, so by removing the middle section, we're still fulfilling this design requirement. The parts I have printed, they're right behind me. Unfortunately, today's day rating is lower than a 4 out of 10. Think about it, my day is a 4 out of 10 today. The chances of it being a 4 out of 10 tomorrow? Unlikely. We've gone all the way down to around a 2. Why is that, you may ask? Well, I've got the flu, not feeling great, hence this. So we persevere. I first mounted some threaded inserts, which I could then mount my toggle clamps to. These toggle clamps are going to allow the two pieces of the iMac case to join together and become one again. After quickly gluing and assembling the iMac case V2, it's now time for the moment of truth, V2. It is looking. And as you would have it, it finally worked. So I could finally chuck my iMac into the suitcase with the addition of a bunch of my clothes, which will hopefully also help protect the iMac. So yeah, see you guys tomorrow. Okay, so this is the moment of truth. Let's see if the iMac survived the journey. Yes. It survived, let's go. So our case did work, it was worth it. So now I'm gonna try and uh, use the iMac with the case still attached and see how it goes. Check it out. It looks like the iMac case is working. If you want to print this case yourself or you want to see more behind the scenes footage of things I didn't have time to cover in this video, then make sure to support me on Patreon. On that note, I do want to thank my current Patreon members, Tara B, Mikey T, Stefan L, and Kingsley Dorak. Your support means a lot and thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.